psychology, but uh, obviously this is uh, of a wide use in, in, in many other systems. So um, I just want to bring forward first uh, how uh, actually immunology uh, started really thinking about uh, cells as the entities uh, important for immunity. So probably the first uh, uh, scientist to coin and understand that uh, uh, immunity is a cell-based system was uh, Ilya Mechnikov, who found um, in various specimen uh, cells that can uh, phagocytose different uh, debris or, or dead cells and so on and so forth. And he called them big eaters or, or macrophages. And obviously, um, in the 80s, immunology really propelled by the ability to uh, define various uh, immune lineages uh, by a specific uh, molecules on the cell surface of uh, immune cells. For example, these molecules represent uh, B cells. And this has gotten to be more and more uh, complicated. Um, T cells, for example, when they are interacting with the uh, various dendritic cells in, in uh, APCs in various contexts, uh, will uh, differentiate to various uh, T helper as we've seen on, on in the previous talk. So again, it's uh, widely complex and, and this complexity actually brings in some cases more uh, confusion than answers. And the reason is that while we know that, you know, Multicellular organisms are built of cell type. That is something we cannot uh, argue. Uh, maybe the US president can, but I think anybody else that uh, actually uh, follows uh, science will say, okay, th this is the units, the basic building block, the atoms of uh, a multicellular organism. But the way we describe, the, describe them currently is really flawed. And we lack a lot of consistency, which is making it very difficult to move forward uh, um, application, clinical applications, and so on. So let's think about it a little bit. So historically, um, like the uh, Mechnikov uh, example, um, cells have been defined by function, morphology, molecular composition, ontogeny, but no single attribute has really served to classify all the cell types that we have. Um, even if we go to uh, immunology uh, only, because there is a lot of uh, contexts that are important. So the history uh, matters, the location of the cell matter, the external environments that it sees, the relation to other cell types and, and the epigenomic, the future potential matter. So all of these things are, are, are critical and so, what uh, our vision is from the starting point, from the very beginning, day one, where the technology didn't work, is that we want to have move from this unquantitative description to a snapshot and then hopefully really dynamic data of genome-wide molecular footprints that can lay a, a reproducible a foundation for cellular coordinates, cell state. So there's a lot of uh, question regarding cell types or cell states. I don't think that uh, actually really matters. The, what matters is the function. So whether this is a state, what uh, we consider a state something that's changing by the environment, it, it, for us it's still as uh, important entity as a, a cell type. In, in, in immunology that can do a very uh, dramatic effect uh, on the uh, outcome of the organism and, and, and immunity per se. And what I think we're moving to, and we're, we're getting there in, in huge steps as, as we see in all of these uh, talk today, is moving from these vague description to really a quantitative manifold where we can overlay all of these uh, very different uh, types of measurement, different tiers of, of the cell, that are allowing us to start to understand how the cells are, uh, what are the cells and how they interact and how genetic changes in them would uh, shift uh, their uh, activity and their state and, and so on and so forth. And this allows us to go beyond the cells and really start to understand molecular pathways at play. And that is uh, extremely important when one wants to uh, perturb them and modify them, uh, whether for clinical use or other. 
And uh, for example, we've shown over the years, genetic perturbations are sometimes difficult to understand e the exact uh, phenotype. But again, if one uh, applies uh, various uh, uh, genetic perturbation models, whether knockout mice or, or, or CRISPR screens, single cell can really allow you to understand the functional activity of the uh, different uh, genes. It allows you to start to understand a dynamic uh, whether, and Alexander talked beautifully about this, whether using uh, different uh, uh, algorithmic approaches or uh, new technologies that I'm sure are going to come in the next year that will be better and better in defining the dynamics of cell in, in immunity. That is absolutely critical to understand how the dynamics is really shifting the activity of the cell. Evolution, again, very important to uh, be able to understand the same cell type or cell state across uh, various uh, organisms, from humans to model organisms and so on and so forth. Um, and starting to understand human pathology. Human pathology is a, a, an extremely rich uh, and changing environment with heterogeneity across the uh, patient and diseases. And again, uh, single cell is used to really propel this uh, area as we've seen uh, also today. <clears throat> Compare and uh, use relevant animal models for the specific pathology and obviously to understand, to start to understand mechanisms of drugs. So really, uh, it's making a huge uh, shift in biology. And I want to discuss some of the uh, areas where we think, or, or new technology that we think are going to uh, leverage and move these uh, even further. So um, the workhorse that we've been using uh, from uh, basically day one is the uh, MARSIC or mass massively paralyzed uh, single cell RNA-seq technology that we developed. Um, the uh, approach is very uh, simple and straightforward where we dissociate tissues and then use uh, fax uh, sorters to uh, uh, basically sort individual cells into plates and then the whole uh, um, molecular approach to uh, label the molecules using UMI and, and, and the cell using barcode and then an analytical pipeline to allow us to uh, map the or define the transcriptional identity and similarity of the different cells. So um, again, I, I think this uh, approach uh, has a, a very important niche given uh, the microfluidic approaches will generate a very uh, large data set, but they have a limitation with uh, scarce uh, clinical samples with the uh, batch effect, which is much, much lower here. And um, as uh, the new faxes that are going to come out uh, next year are going to be better and better and faster and allowing uh, much more uh, um, uh, floor for us to use, I think this will uh, give a very good competition in the next year to uh, the microfluidic uh, commercial approaches such as Tenex. Um, this is uh, basically the first study that really showed that we can um, actually use single cell to define the various immune subsets without the need for any markers. And, and we've shown we can identify all of the known uh, splenic uh, immune subsets and uh, identify more heterogeneity within uh, certain subsets, even in this very uh, simple uh, immune uh, uh, tissue in, within uh, naive, naive mice, for example, the, uh, DC2 uh, showed a lot of the uh, complexity that was not defined at that, uh, at, at that time. But I think uh, the direction that we all want to go and there's a great uh, need uh, to, to move uh, and propel this area is to really understand the complexity of immune subsets within and, and stromal subsets within the tumor uh, microenvironment this is a, a very a rich and dynamic uh, uh, environment as we've seen in, in the uh, previous talk. And obviously uh, we want to understand which uh, patients will actually benefit from the treatment and, and respond once there are uh, uh, treatments. Again, th there are very dramatic changes in patients that do respond. And these uh, mechanisms of response are uh, very, uh, are, are at this point very vague. So the, the single cell tools, if uh, approached uh, properly, can uh, allow us to reveal some of these mechanisms and we're working very hard 
to uh, define the mechanism of known immunotherapy drugs and use it to develop uh, also uh, such a future uh, therapy. <clears throat> but uh, again, a major uh, limitation with the uh, standard single cell RNA-seq that uh, I think was discussed uh, throughout, it gives us only one uh, uh, type of uh, data regarding the cells. We are losing a lot of uh, other important contexts, and some of them we are uh, uh, showing, I'm showing uh, here in this uh, review that we wrote. And these uh, new tools, I think, are going to be very important. The dynamics of the immune system within uh, tumors and, and uh, the dynamics in general is a, a field that we have a very little uh, knowledge about. And, <clears throat> and I think uh, Alexander talk really showed beautifully how important it is to start to understand the dynamics of, of various biological systems from, from tumors to uh, the immune system. The spatial organization uh, of the immune cells and their interaction with the different uh, stromal and tumor cells, how, cell, uh, cell, how cells interact with one another is critically important, especially in the immune system where various uh, cells uh, allow uh, T cells or, or other cells to uh, initiate a cascade of uh, differentiation and, and activation. And all of these communication are driven by uh, such cell cells of communication. And we currently have uh, little information how these uh, occur uh, within uh, healthy tissues and obviously within uh, different pathologies such as tumors, uh, uh, clonal relationship, uh, the ability to do uh, CRISPR Y genetic screens. Um, with single cell and T cell and, and, and B cell clonality. So there, there are many aspects that are currently not uh, measured by uh, the uh, standard single cell genomics. And, and all of these are, I think, uh, heavily uh, pushed by uh, many labs. And the, I think this is a, a wonderful and uh, very important uh, thing that the single cell community should continue to to, to do and not uh, trust only on uh, commercial technologies. I'm going to um, describe two such technologies that I think are going to be important to start to understand um, the involvement of uh, immune system within a, a tumor and, and especially tumor uh, escape mechanism. So the first and, and one of the, uh, I think, the large question is how uh, actually the various cells within the tumor communicate to one another and modify uh, the various uh, activity. And initially, we started to try to use uh, all uh, types of analytic approaches to uh, understand ligand and interaction within uh, the large uh, maps of uh, various uh, organs and tissues and, and pathology. <clears throat> For example, in the, the, this study shown below um, that uh, Amir and Merab uh, spearheaded, we uh, looked at uh, uh, ligand receptor pair within the developing lung. <clears throat> and the analysis uh, that uh, this analysis of ligand receptor pair really allowed us to pinpoint unique interaction that were not known at the time which uh, drove uh, research that we would not do in any other way. So one can think about it as a screen that allows you to uh, uh, see uh, such uh, ligand and receptor interaction, potential ligand receptor interaction uh, until validated. These are, are obviously uh, something that uh, one should take cautiously, but potential uh, interaction that may drive the function of, of the tissue. And in this study, which is published, so I, I'll only describe this graphical abstract, we found very uh, interesting and, and unexplored interaction uh, until that time of secretion of IL-33 by the 82, the alveolar um, uh, cells. And uh, these uh, uh, cytokines really change or modify the basophil into becoming lung resident basophils. <clears throat> These lung resident basophils then secreted many cytokines which are important for the alveolar uh, macrophage differentiation. So if any of these uh, interaction was perturbed, as we showed in, in many different uh, approaches in vivo and in vitro, one uh, do not uh, have these uh, uh, alveolar macrophages, which are uh, critically important in, in many functions. One of them, as we've seen, is to 
reduce the activity of the immune system in uh, so, uh, cases such as viral insult in the COVID-19. So this, um, these different uh, interactions play a very uh, critical role in, in uh, lung uh, immune uh, activity, the cross between the lung and the immune system. <clears throat> so this is one approach, but this has, uh, can take you uh, so far. And what we wanted to do is to have a technology that deterministically allows us to understand cell-cell interaction within uh, uh, different uh, tissues and pathologies, especially if one uh, considers uh, actually all the uh, immunotherapeutic drugs that are currently used for immuno-oncology, they are all molecules that are blocking such interaction, many interaction between uh, dendritic cells and T cells, such as the PDL1, or, or uh, dendritic cells or T cells with other uh, APC. So, communication and understanding such communication uh, in the tumor is critically important to allow us to think about uh, developing uh, new uh, frontiers or new generation of uh, immunotherapeutic drugs. And to make a, a long uh, story short, um, I'm describing a technology developed by uh, Merab Cohen and, and Amir Kiladi here. <clears throat> what they use is, again, a very uh, simple and straightforward approach. Uh, and the idea was that um, what we want to really uh, do is maintain the in situ interactions of cell within the tissue and then use markers that are uniquely expressed on only one of the cell types that we want to look at, and then use double uh, markers to sort for um, cells that will be shared, cells that be actual peaks, actual real interaction between the cells or potential real interaction between the cells. <clears throat> in this technology, we also uh, sort singlets, and I'll explain that in a second. But following analysis, this can start to uh, outline what are the uh, cells that are interacting in the tissue and how they signal and modify one, one another when they are interacting, when they're interacting. So the idea is uh, quite uh, straightforward, again, also in the analytical uh, aspect. So what we do is we first simulate all potential interaction from the singlet cell of the specific uh, cell that we want to focus on uh, their interaction, for example, T cells and, and dendritic cells. Once we know what would be the simulated doublets, what we expect to, to see in the tissue given the singlets, we can then uh, analyze the uh, peaks and see which interaction are occurring more frequently than we expect by chance. And this allows us to really overcome uh, many uh, technical problems of uh, such interaction that will happen in vitro and so on and so forth. So the, the paper really outlines how to apply this uh, technology on uh, uh, such interaction that uh, one is interested. And what's even um, uh, more uh, important here that it also allows us to then deconvolute the cells and understand which of the cells are contributing which molecules and how these molecules are changing and these molecules here, once the cells are interacting, once there is a specific interaction, how do, uh, or what are the changes that we see, what type of signaling is really happening in these uh, physical interacting cells. So as we've uh, tested and, and calibrated again and again for every tissue, this really allows us to, to find these very rare events where cells are interacting with dendritic cell T. So this is not uh, something that, is, is frequent, uh, whether in lymph nodes or, or, or in tumors and so on, and really capture these rare events and start to understand how they are communicating and what cell types are, are communicating in, in, in what type of environments. Um, in one of the uh, unpublished work um, that we're uh, really excited about, again, we sorted uh, myeloid cells using a very broad uh, set of uh, myeloid markers. Uh, T cells, again, broad T cell markers, so all T cells, all myeloid cells, and, and, and started to look at how they interact. And the <clears throat> study was designed such that we want to find interactions that are not occurring in the normal tissue. From every patient, we take both the healthy, health or somewhat healthy non-tumorogenic tissue compared to the tumor microenvironment. And um, again, I'm going to show a bit of this uh, uh, data. Um, and because of the lack of time. But uh, basically what we, we see there are many uh, changes which are uh, unique 
to the tumor environment and especially interacting changes. So interactions that are only occurring within the tumor and, and not in the uh, normal uh, tissue. And using this uh, very uh, important uh, approach, what we found is a, a new uh, a T cell subset, which we call THT or T helper uh, tumor. Um, it has unique uh, molecules and properties. It's different uh, from uh, Tregs or, or obviously from the uh, CD8s and the uh, naive or, or uh, cytotoxic T cells. And uh, we could uh, actually show that these are cells which are specific to the tumor antigen, like the dysfunctional T cells, clonal, and they reside uh, within uh, in interaction with uh, APCs within uh, the tumor. We, we then uh, went on to show in various uh, mouse model using uh, OT2 T cells and, and B16 OVA that this uh, um, gene uh, signature and, and gene model uh, specific to uh, CD4 that interact with the tumor is uh, reproducible in mice. And that allows us to uh, also study the function of these cells and really understand the, the biology of these uh, uh, new and important uh, tumor uh, specific T cell subsets. And again, this is showing the same uh, type of identification of these cells within uh, uh, the OT2 uh, tumor models and the interaction of uh, APCs and, and these uh, specific T cells. So in, in the time uh, remain, remaining, I want to uh, discuss another technology that we're very excited about. And, and again, um, which allows us to uh, look deeper into uh, characterizing the role of uh, new immune subsets within uh, the tumor microenvironment. And uh, this uh, technology allows us to uh, measure and uh, sort not only based on the extracellular proteins, which are uh, relatively a small amount of the proteins that dictate uh, cellular uh, function, <clears throat> something like in the order of 10%, and if we think about uh, uh, protein modification, even much less, but also look at uh, metabolic activities, transcription factors, and signaling, and use these to home in and focus on uh, very specific immune subsets uh, within uh, tumors or, or other tissues. And the idea is to basically uh, use uh, various fixative to then permeabilize the cell. What uh, then allows us to uh, introduce antibodies, intracellular antibodies that uh, can uh, measure uh, different uh, modifications or uh, metabolic activities. And then <clears throat> since the cells are uh, now uh, um, fixed and the RNA is intact, we can uh, either use our uh, MARSIC approach or uh, even the TENIX approach to um, sequence these cells and start to understand an overlay uh, on top of the transcriptional data, uh, various uh, signaling and, and other intracellular events uh, in the cell, and then build a much richer understanding of uh, the immune compartment within tumor. And this was uh, spearheaded by uh, two uh, uh, amazing uh, master uh, students at the time, which are now doing PhD, Jonathan and uh, Fadi, together with uh, Adam, uh, Asaf, and uh, Ido Yoker. <clears throat> and uh, the uh, technology is, is uh, extremely robust. If we uh, uh, use this to uh, uh, look at the uh, um, signal of uh, various uh, protein markers, you can see that insect is very comparable to uh, uh, current uh, known fixatives such as uh, methanol and uh, PFA. On the other hand, if one looks at the uh, RNA, and uh, again, these uh, standard fixatives are really uh, causing very major loss in the uh, RNA uh, degradation and um, activation of various enzymes which uh, further uh, degrade the RNA. Um, we, with the insect uh, fixation, uh, the, both uh, the, R, the cells are preserved, the RNA within the cells are, are preserved for uh, almost indefinitely, as well as um, 
the uh, intact of the RNA is, is almost uh, similar to cells that were uh, that are fresh that are uh, un untouched. So we have a very minor loss uh, compared to something in the order of a hundred to a thousand fold in the various uh, other fixing. If we look at the uh, cellular composition, and, and this is using uh, 10x uh, sequencing, what we basically see that um, we maintain the same uh, uh, cells uh, within uh, either in vivo samples or in vitro cultures. And if we look at the molecules that are uh, defining the signal molecule defining these cells, we see uh, basically the same uh, intensity and the, and, uh, the same uh, molecule. So this doesn't change the cells uh, or their uh, molecules uh, significantly. <clears throat> Again, uh, we test this in, in quite a wide range of uh, different uh, samples uh, by now, and uh, it seems to be quite robust uh, to uh, most of the cases we tested. Um, to benchmark this and, and really show this is uh, allowing us to uh, do uh, and, and understand uh, new biology, we looked at a transcription factor, for example, again, uh, several uh, immune subsets can only be defined by uh, the activity of intracellular signaling or transcription factor, and there are no uh, clear uh, cell surface markers. Um, T regulatory cells are, are one example. They're, they're not a clear markers to define them. And um, the FOXP3 uh, transcription factor is the uh, best uh, definition of uh, these T regulatory cells. And so to show that our technology is really robust, we use either FOXP3 uh, RFP or use from the same uh, mouse and antibody which uh, then uh, uh, labels uh, the FOXP3 positive cells. And, and uh, following this, we sequenced the, the two samples. And basically what you can see is both uh, enrich in a, a similar proportion, uh, reaching in the order of uh, 70 to 80% of the uh, T-reg population within uh, various uh, tissues. <clears throat> this is, again, can also be achieved from uh, um, cases where the T-regs are even more rare within uh, the peripheral blood of, of human. Again, uh, the FOXP3 antibody uh, basically enriches for these uh, rare uh, T-reg cells within uh, human blood. <clears throat> and this um, is something we are building up to, to generate a huge atlas of the different uh, transcription factors that are defining uh, the uh, various uh, human uh, T-cell and T-cell activities. Again, this is just showing how we can uh, start to combine uh, transcription factors such as uh, TCF7, which defines naive cells, ID2, which uh, defines uh, uh, the activity of uh, more cytotoxic models and, and really start to overlay these and look for uh, case, the rare cases where uh, one has more naive uh, memory cells, which have both uh, TCF7 and ID2. <clears throat> and, um, Obviously this, obviously, this has a, a, a clinical implication. One can start to identify Tregs in, in various tissue, understand which molecules uniquely define uh, these Tregs. For example, here we're looking at Tregs from the tumor environments versus the lymph node, and then use these molecules to target specifically Tregs in a, in a specific site and uh, avoid uh, some of the uh, potential uh, uh, damage that can happen by uh, globally targeting uh, T-Reg. In the next uh, uh, piece of uh, data that I, I want to share with you, there is uh, a uh, growing uh, challenge uh, that was discussed in one of the uh, earlier uh, talks uh, today. And that is un understanding, better understanding of the different myeloid subsets uh, within tumor. So myeloid cells are uh, extremely responsive to the environment. Uh, monocyte macrophage respond to many, many different cues from hypoxia to uh, cell death to others. And understanding which uh, myeloid subsets are pro-tumorigenic, meaning blocking the activity uh, of T cells versus anti-tumor uh, 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 myeloid cells, which are contributing to inflammation is very critical to think about a myeloid uh, cell therapy. Again, the, the, the challenge uh, with this is that such uh, cells, which are uh, called in many uh, different names, we, we 
Uh, these are really lineage uh, vague cells. There is no clear uh, markers uh, to define them. Um, we call them ghost cells. <clears throat> were defined, um, these myelodiary suppressors were defined in many uh, different ways. But what uh, is coming uh, clear from all of these studies that these cells have very uh, unique uh, metabolic activity. For example, they uh, have high levels of the enzyme arginase 1 or ARG1, which uh, inhibits uh, T cell activity and many other intracellular uh, uh, signaling and uh, metabolic uh, pathways. So we decided to make a, a, an approach, an attempt to really start to define these uh, subsets in tumors and understand how we can better target them and how we can uh, better characterize them using um, antibodies that can separate between ARG1 positive and, and ARG1 negative cells. And that's exactly what we did with the uh, insect technology. We could label now ARG1 and, and many other uh, metabolic enzymes and then uh, sequence them and start to understand which uh, um, molecular features are defining these uh, various subsets of cells. To make a long uh, story short, um, how long do I have? How much time do I have? I, I cannot hear, I, it's muted. All right, you have talked for almost uh, 40 minutes. Okay, so like another five minutes is okay? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, a few minutes, uh, yeah. Okay, I'll try to, to finish uh, uh, quickly. <clears throat> anyway, to make a long story, for, uh, long story short, we have uh, two major subsets that define ARG1 uh, positive cells. These are uh, regulatory uh, macrophages that we uh, label, label as MREG1 and MREG2 and uh, more standard uh, uh, TAMs. Uh, they obviously, the MREGs, uh, the regulatory uh, macrophages are uh, expressing very uh, high levels of ARG1 and uh, other uh, molecules uh, as defined here. And this allows us to start to uh, uh, use different cell surface markers to sort and uh, functionally work on these uh, different subsets. So, um, Using uh, various methods where we uh, look at the activity of these cells, for example, by uh, combining them with uh, T cells and looking at various T cells activity, we could see that these emeric cells are indeed not only expressing the highest levels of ARG1, but the most suppressive cell that one has uh, within the tumor environment. They strongly suppress T cell activation and T cell proliferation. And what was also interesting about these cells that they express TREM2, and TREM2 is a, a new immune signaling uh, pathway that uh, we discovered uh, back in the days in uh, Alzheimer's. And it's a very strong immunosuppressive uh, pathway as, we, as we've seen. And again, we saw it in brain, adipose tree, tissue, and liver. And uh, what it does is uh, detect uh, various forms of neurodegeneration of dead neurons and then activating a very strong immunosuppressive response. It is almost uh, completely not expressed in, in the healthy uh, uh, organs, in the healthy, in, in healthy tissue, um, except for the brain and a few other tissues. However, once uh, this pathway, uh, innate immune pathway detects uh, pathology, it initiates a very, very robust immune suppressive pathway. Um, <clears throat> and that uh, is something that really excites us because this is something uh, potentially uh, that can be targeted and, and will be synergistic with the uh, current immunotherapy. Indeed, what we showed in trying to knock out mice that these mice uh, uh, have uh, tumors that grow uh, much slower. Uh, a major uh, uh, immune ch uh, change is that uh, without TREM2, the MREGs are uh, uh, diminishing very significantly and we see much less dysfunctional CD8 cells and much more uh, NK cells and, and activated immune response. Uh, this is uh, also synergistic with uh, PD-1. So there's many uh, uh, important features around this and, and we think that's uh, a very important uh, direction. This myeloid or macrophage regulatory cells plays a very important role in the tumor. Um, and we've shown that in, in many ways, both in, in vivo and in various in vitro models. So I'd like to um, just end here again. This, we think this technology is uh, extremely important. It's still many hurdles uh, in front of us to uh, 
develop more and more antibodies that work uh, work well with this uh, technology and, and so on. So last but not least, really acknowledge um, the amazing people who did this work. Um, many of the work were in collaboration with the lab. Uh, Ton Schumacher and, and others here, and I, I mentioned the student uh, who developed all this and uh, thanking the, all the funding agencies who helped us uh, do all this research. Thank you. Thank you, Ido. Uh, yeah, very uh, interesting uh, overview of uh, uh, new studies on uh, uh, immunology. Uh, uh, due to the limited time, how about we have, uh, we, uh, you get two questions. Um, it's uh, uh, getting late here in, in Beijing and we have one more talk. <clears throat> Uh, hi, can I ask the first question? Hi, Professor. Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yeah, of course. Yes. Uh, I have two, two naive technical questions. First is for PRC sick. How do you distinguish the uh, two interactions and uh, from incomplete dissociation? And the second right. question is for, for in sick. Uh, uh, it reminds me of sex sick. Uh, uh, why not just uh, conjugate the antibody with the DNA barcode, then just uh, amplify, amplify them with the mRNA? Is there any difficulties with the with, with the intracellular protein? Yeah. So, the, the, so two great question, technical great questions. So, first, uh, discriminating between real uh, peaks that are in situ versus uh, events that are happening in vitro or uh, un. Um, uh, uh, let's say unthorough uh, dissociation. So uh, the technology again allows us to, because we use the fact to actually uh, discriminate between aggregates that are more than two cells and, and, and two cells based on the uh, antibody labeling. We know when it's uh, um, an aggregate, let's say bigger than uh, two cells and, and we've actually measured this and counted this and, and these are uh, rare events that uh, do not significantly affect the data. Uh, what we worry more about are uh, events where in vitro, post uh, uh, the, the event that you separate the cell, they, they come together and may conjugate. And, and again, uh, it's a, a quite elaborate answer. So we have both uh, uh, experimental and analytical methods to actually understand whether this is the case by switching the fluorophores is one way that we test for this. Is it something that is happening in, in vitro? And the other uh, approach is analytically. So we are, not, we are looking for cases where the interaction actually changed the activity of the two cells. So if there are interactions that do not change activity, it's something uh, of, let's say, uh, less uh, uh, importance in terms of what we see. So again, this is something that cannot happen in vitro under the um, um, condition that the, we uh, manage the sample. Um, again, we, we, we thoroughly discuss this and the, and the limitation and how one should set up the system, but if it's of interest to you to set up such a system, I'd be really happy to, to discuss this and, and explain uh, all the measures that should be taken and all the control that uh, should be put forward to test for, for this. Um, regarding your second uh, question, um, Obviously, barcode and antibody uh, uh, site sec like are uh, uh, definitely the uh, next step. And this is something that we want to uh, uh, come with uh, in, in the very near future. Um, the challenge is compared to the um, extracellular protein is that you have a lot of nucleic acids inside the cell, DNA and other, and this makes the, these uh, antibodies very sticky. So, there are a much uh, higher noise level than one has when you conjugate a fluorophore. So we're working on this, different blocking uh, uh, ways uh, to reduce uh, this uh, noise and increase the, sig the signal. Uh, I think it should be uh, coming out in our next version of the technology. All okay, right. thanks. Uh, yeah, Honggui, I only gave two questions and you asked two, but I really <laughs> want to mean to ask the final question. Doming? 
Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Great. Uh, so I want just just want to follow up with a, a question about INS Seq, which sounds very interesting, where you're able to detect intracellular proteins. But I guess you know, seems like you need to permeate the cells first, then to allow yeah. the signal come come back come in the cell. So I wonder if you if if you do that, I, I, you, I, I guess you must have lost some signals because cells RNA flow out because you permeate cell in a certain way. So do you anticipate that this technology will detect a lower number of genes or transcripts uh, compared to sitesic that it intend to detect, you know, binds to cell surface protein without permeating the cells? Yeah. So, you know, I don't think molecule RNA molecules are actually floating in the cell, and and the fixation is somewhat maintaining them intact with the various proteins that they were in contact before, and and the structures in, in the cells that were in contact before. Um, we do see a loss, but it, it's it's relatively minor. You know, it's a, and we're getting it. Uh, more and more uh, to levels where you know it's in the range of the 20 percent or so loss so uh, I think that's not a, a major issue that uh, uh, that we are worrying about uh, the, the more I think a uh, important uh, aspect is to uh, be able to increase the amount of uh, intracellular antibodies that are uh, working well and 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 really um, uh, enable to to you know not look at uh, one or two or five, but really thirty or forty different uh, metabolic signatures and and uh, and this number of different signaling molecules and, and that's I think is a very uh, important uh, direction that we're pushing. All right. Thank you very much, Ido. All right, thank you, Ido, for the thank very you. interesting lecture. Last but not least, we have. Professor Patrick Enforce, uh, Professor Enforce, you here?